you're at the Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub where we enjoy conversations with people who are engaged in the world of coaching. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Coaching Inn. I'm your host Claire Pedrick and uh, well today we're going to talk to Debs Wright. The most important thing I want to tell you about Debs Wright is that she is one of the people who come on our coaches walking in the Malvern Hills. And for me, that's the most significant thing. And what a delight it is to walk with Debs. So when she said that she was doing um, study with human in the title, she has to come, right? So Debs Wright. Oh, yeah. And you're supposed, I'm supposed to tell you. If you like the podcast, if you'd like to subscribe or follow in the platform where you listen, that would be great. <laughs> now I've done the right thing. Welcome, Debs Wright. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And on the coaches' walks in Malvern, um, yesterday in the coaching circle um, uh, that I held, I think we had three people all say, I want to join you on those walks. So um, they so are absolutely brilliant yes I'm really, really I hope you didn't tell them about the rainy one <laughs> <laughs> might have been a bit of an omission there to be honest but um, yeah. they'll come yeah. along <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you know listeners that you know sometimes if you if you start something and things happen they get a fixed names our last walk is always going to be no known as the capital T rainy capital R one capital O anyway Debs Tell us about your research. Well, tell us a bit about your journey into coaching first and then tell us about your research. Uh, well, to be honest, Claire, I think the two are so intertwined that that oh. sort of works. So um, um, my, my background is in the military. Um, I was in the Royal Air Force for 23 years. Then in 2018, um, I had this moment of realising that I might know quite a lot about Debs in the military, but I didn't know an awful lot about her as a human on her own. So mm -hmm. I began a lot of study. I did a master's in positive psychology, um, which in that introduced me to coaching. Um, I then thought, oh, coaching in the Air Force would be a wonderful thing to introduce, um, but began to love it so much that I then became a full-time coach about two years ago. Yeah. And at the same time as leaving the military and becoming a full-time coach, I began a doctorate which was sort of my goodbye present from the Air Force. It was my period to reflect because it was a it's a, a doctorate by public works. So it's not a full PhD, but it's where I took my work in the Air Force and used that as my research. Um, and I thought what I was going to be writing about was being a woman in a very masculine environment. I thought it was all going to be about gender because that was absolutely the lens that I arrived with. And then as I put the final sort of um, finishing touches to my, my first draft, I thought, this is nothing about being a woman. This is about being a human being. And this is about what being human brings in terms of being a leader. And so much of, res of that resonates then with being a coach. Because leadership to me is sort of this, this triangle of mindfulness, coaching and positive psychology of building people up and looking at people's strengths. But ultimately, that means just connecting to yourself as a human being and having the confidence, the courage, the vulnerability to show up every day as yourself and see who's inspired by that. So, so that's what the research is all about. Showing up every day as yourself yeah, and seeing who's inspired by that. Yes. I'm inspired by that sentence, Debs. Because <laughs> so often people don't show up as themselves at work. Yeah. And that was really where I began my research. Um, so to be very open and vulnerable with you, I joined the Air Force in 1999. So it was the end of the 90s. I'd grown up in my teens and 20s in the 90s where and this is a bit of a gendered lens but being a woman had a very specific angle to it it felt you know it was very much the ladette culture it was very much the equal meant same ah and so i then put myself into this very masculine environment 
And um, my first thing was to conform. I absolutely wanted to succeed. And I knew, I thought, that route to success, which was to emulate the people who had been in the Air Force for the generations before me and the generations before that. Um, So I had two, um, uh, I think, uh, um, sort of ways that I was known. I was known for um, being very physically fit um, and uh, drinking the lads under the table because these were sort of the two ways that I could conform in this environment. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those didn't suit me very well. The drinking did not last very long because I could not sustain that. The physical fitness did. But I think I, I really came from that, from an angle of thinking I needed to be the same as the men in that environment. Um, and then, of course, once you start conforming in a large organisation like that, you can also then start being a bit, a bit complicit and you can start judging other people if they're not wanting to um, conform in the same way that you did. And I definitely, definitely was was guilty of that for the first few years. And so I think it took me a long time. I think it was about 20 years before I actually started to realise that if I pitched up as myself every day, which took a lot of courage, it took a lot of understanding. I didn't even know who I was. So to do that um, was one of the bravest things I ever did. And of course, that's actually the better way of being a leader. Um, And I hope it's one of the better way of being a coach as well, because you sort of have to remind yourself every day. It's just shedding everything and pitching up and letting other people respond to you. Because deep down inside, I think if we don't do that, there's a there's the human side of us recognizing that what's being seen and experienced isn't quite us that we're that we're masking, we're hiding, we're covering something up. Mm-hmm. So, so many questions. Uh, this is a podcast, so I can choose not ask you. So. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting! Um, what did people see? In that transition from trying to become the same to turning up as a human and a woman? Oh, that's really interesting. So for some people, I think it really confused them. Oh. Because I think they were seeing the same person, but maybe my reactions to them were different. Um, And that's maybe on the more negative side. There were definitely some relationships which were quite challenged by that because it was almost as if Debs, we've been playing the same game for the last 20 years and now you seem to be doing something a bit bit different um what they would have seen is somebody who really consciously began to think about not talk about myself in the third person but I, I would spend every day thinking what is it that I'm going to get out of today what is it that I'm going to bring to today and to such an extent I even had a list of sort of the emotions I wanted to bring into my leadership up on a whiteboard in my office so I had the pride that I felt in the air force I had the gratitude that I felt for the life I'd got I'd got the um the joy that I like to experience and it was thinking right so When I talk to people, which of those emotions are they going to to experience by having that conversation? So I don't know whether people would have seen anything different. I understand people felt different. Ah. They felt as if I cared, which I always had done. And that that was always quite quite a sad thing for me to go through, to realise that actually the caring person that I was is what everyone wanted. It's just that I'd been hiding that a bit behind a bit of a bit of a body armour, a bit of defence. Wow. So what kind of things did they say to you? Um, oh, I'm trying to think of some good things here. But um, for the people who my leadership really resonated with, they really began to reflect back to me some of the language that I was using. So they would talk about um what moments of joy they've had in that day um and they would talk about the pride they felt either in their kids football or in the work that they were doing um for people who it didn't really resonate with i had to sort of 
just let it wash off me. That it might feel a bit, a bit softer than maybe they were used to talking. But for a lot of people, actually, it just opened up a huge number of conversations about who they were out of uniform, about who their families were, about what motivated them, about what keeps them going. Um, and that, to me, was the very best thing that you get about being a, a leader is just talking to people about who they are. Mm. Wow. Uniform. When you were first speaking, I had a question which, make it your own, about uniform and being human. <laughs> what are you learning about being human and being in uniform? And being in uniform? So I think the two can coexist, definitely. Um, but I think it takes more work to understand who the human is that puts a uniform on than it does just to become the human you think you need to be when you put the uniform on. Um, and going back to my doctorate, that's sort of one of the things that I've concluded is that when you go into a large organisation, Leadership's often seen as how you lead a team, how you lead change, how you lead an organisation. But actually, the fundamental pillar at the bottom of all of that should be how you lead yourself. And I think conscious engagement with self-leadership to really explore and understand and know yourself. To me, that's the art of being human. Mm. But that's often the the bit of leadership that sort of skipped over um so i think if you're going to put people in uniform spend some time investing in who they are and help them understand who they are so that they know where they begin where the uniform ends and they don't just continue to behave in a way that perhaps people wearing that uniform in previous generations did they can bring in new behaviours that actually the uniform can then be proud of in the future. So a bit of flesh on the bones. Yeah. Yeah. Quite literally, the bit of human flesh on the human bones before you put yeah. the uniform on. Yeah. There's um, an open table coming up this weekend, I think. Uh, and one of the things that, that they're new coaches who are celebrating where they where they are and and there's a great quote where maria fernandez says um i got my hundred coaching hours and each of those coaching hours was a person <laughs> and that's what you're describing here isn't it that actually the the, the in the uniform are the people and, yeah. and how do we enable the people to be people before yeah. they put the uniform on yeah and and whilst I know the military is very particular because it has a, a set uniform that people are issued, I think anybody in a large organisation in any sector will recognise there's a uniform that's often put in, uh, put on before you go to work. And, and it might be one that you've chosen for yourself, but often it's one where you think you will belong and where you then won't be othered and therefore you are already sort of conforming to a degree. belonging and not being othered are very human aren't they and then you say and then you'll conform to a degree yeah yeah i am um, i've not yet read the book that you have recommended about belonging and othering um, it's really hard to read <laughs> <laughs> if you could read it when i finished it that will make me read it before the next walk but i i'd love your views on this actually because and this might well be where the book covers, but I, I think as a leader, you're almost at that tension point of belonging and othering. Because one of the criteria of a leader is that you can really make a tight knitted team that will do anything for each other. I mean, particularly in the defence world, that's what you're yeah. basically asking. But how do you do that without othering people? And as a leader, you sort of need to be the one who's able to turn to the inn and go, who, who are we making feel that they belong? But also turn to the other side and say, and who are we othering? 
um, and see what what that tension is, because I, I don't yet know what the answer is mm. to make people feel that they belong without othering people. And that that to me would be genuine definition of human leadership is where everyone feels a sense of belonging without being othered. OK, so here's my commitment. I will finish it <laughs> and then I'll lend it to you and then we can talk about it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Everyone needs a bit of accountability. <laughs> so what else did you discover? I mean, I'm, I'm so interested, Debs, that you've come at this whole exploration from the world of uniform. Mm. And also, as you're talking, how relevant what you're learning is to any organisation yeah. and any kind of leadership. So what else did you did you notice um because this was a very personal reflection um what i really noticed was understanding yourself and knowing yourself means embracing all of yourself and i came up with a a concept which i i'll, I'll think i'll think of a better label for it but at the moment is internal intersectionality ah. which fundamentally means understanding and appreciating all of yourself um, because when you look at intersectionality in the outside world you know where you've got sort of a, a blend of um, uh, protected characteristics there's generally seen in a bit of a negative um, sort of suppressing sort of way that this is not a good thing and it people are penalized for it and I think Gosh, you know, I feel very vulnerable saying this because I hope I'm not on my own. But I think we have all got parts of our characters that we don't like yeah. and that we would rather. I agree. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we now have 100 percent turnout in this in this studio. <laughs> um, and, and again, in the, in the military, and that is my experience, willpower and control and self-discipline is the preferred way of dealing with those things that we don't like. Oh. Um, and that is quite exhausting. Because it's a bit like pitching up not as yourself. You've got to put energy then into that willpower and that control. Um, but for me, really getting to know yourself and all aspects and being able to work in a safe space to sort of go, oh, I really don't like that about myself. Um, and actually, I've done some things that I really wish I hadn't. Why did I end up there? Um, and the example I always give, um, and this comes back to me conforming and then becoming complicit, is very early on in my military career, um, a colleague of mine was publicly shamed for behaviour. And I joined in in that shaming because I thought that individual didn't know the rules and wasn't um, abiding by them. And therefore they, for want of a better word, deserved, in inverted commas, what was coming for them as I say that out loud and I've told this story so many times my stomach absolutely churns I just think I do not like the part of me that was willing to go to that very dark space and actually be really quite horrible to somebody else um, and now I can look at it and go well I was very young I was trying to conform actually the whole system didn't work but if you just try and ignore those bits of you, you don't ever learn from them. And actually, they can grow and grow. Whereas if you begin to really deep into why did I behave like that? That's when you can be a real human and a real leader. And that's what we need. Yeah, and as you're talking, you know, we've we've only just been talking about belonging and othering. As you're talking, it sounds like there was some public othering. Mm -hmm. In service of belonging. Yeah. And I think we do that to bits of ourselves as well. Oh. Inside. I think there are bits of us that we think, oh, yeah, I'm really happy with that part of me. I want to show the world. I want to put my arm around it and say, yay, this is me. And there are other parts of ourselves which we go, well, oh, I hope I'm the only one who knows that exists. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to stay well over there. <laughs> yeah. But actually, my coaching work, those, when you can begin to friend those bits of yourself, 
that is where I think you see real transformation in people just becoming the human that they they've always had the potential to be but they've sort of put so much energy into hiding that bit of themselves that they're not putting the energy into moving forward with the whole of themselves. The picture that comes to mind is 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 something about not having the roots mm. and and paying a lot of attention to the plant that's growing above the soil but not really paying attention to what's underneath it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. The the analogy I use throughout my doctorate is a murmuration of starlings. Ah. Uh, Cuz well, I we just have that here. <laughs> Every day. And I, oh, do you have them daily do you? Oh, they're oh, Yeah. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh, well, yes. Oh, I love coming to Malvern anyway. I need to come over more well, often. come to Malvern at the right time in the, in the winter. Come, come for breakfast. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I think the murmuration of Starlings works for me because what I imagine is that the whole murmuration is a single identity. And yet within that identity, you've got all the different bits. And you sort of go, well, are they all getting on really well together? Or are there some sort of going, oh, I wish you weren't there. Um, And I I just love that sort of the changing shape, but also the fact that you can have one identity as a whole, but in that side, that identity, you have all the different parts as well. But um, I love that one about the what you were saying there about the roots and the roots, really, it's that knowing yourself and I suppose that to me is what being human is is being able to know who you are can I tell you the funniest thing about murmurations is that they all have their own trees Mm -hmm. so when they when they arrive they they so they do it in the morning and the evening so they arrive and they'll all just go into their tree so if you walk down there it's just at the end of this path if you walk down there you can see them all random, and it doesn't look like there are many of them. And then one leads. My dad said that he'd heard a radio program that said it's always the same one. One of them leads, and then off they go. Wow. And then they go up, and yeah. then they split into three, mm-hmm. and they whizzy off in their three, in three different directions, and then they do a twisty twiny thing and reconnect. And then off they go for the day, and then they come back and do it again in the evening. It's amazing. It is incredible, incredible. Yeah, I'm going to come up and um, uh, watch that. <laughs> so I'd better get on with reading Belonging and Not Othering Men. <laughs> <laughs> when I can get over the fact that one of the authors spells their name in lowercase, which is, is, makes me want to other them. <laughs> I want to go, oh, you don't belong here if you don't spell your name with a capital letter. I'm sure there's a reason for that, which will emerge if I read more of the book. So what else did you learn, Debs? I I think there's different stages of leading in an organisation, which was conformity, complicity, awareness, and then navigating. I think that intersectionality of self was was really um, important. Um, I also think the... um, appreciation of self was the thing that um, really came up and that again most probably comes from the fact that as an individual I've motivated myself a lot throughout life by fear by not being good enough by having an inner critic um, and actually trying to work with myself with kindness with motivation with um, a sense of this is the right thing to do as opposed to you don't want to avoid doing the wrong thing um that that was really quite transformational as well because i think that was very different from what the traditional military leadership was when i i first joined which which was really quite harsh um not maybe as harsh as it had been in the 80s and 70s but it it was you know quite a authoritarian sort of transactional approach Um, and thankfully it's changed now a lot i mean i do do recognize that as the humans within the military have changed, so has the leadership changed. Mm. Um, So it wouldn't really surprise you. Um, But I think part of that is that ability to to appreciate all aspects of yourself, whether you like them or not. So what would you say to a woman joining the military now, at the age you were when you joined? 
or I, any human. Yeah, I I think the thing I would say is really invest in knowing yourself. But to do that and to remain true to yourself in that organisation, you need to have support around you. You can't do it on your own. And so look at where you get that support. Um, I, I think, I hope, that the women in the military are more supportive of each other now than they were when I first joined up. Because at the time, it was a real scarcity mindset. You would literally have one woman in each group of 10 men. And there was almost a sense of you're competing against one another mm. as the women rather than with the men. Whereas now I think with more women, they might support one another. But actually, um, and I would say this, wouldn't I? Think about getting a coach from the outset so that you can actually continue to explore what are my values alongside what are the organisational values? You know, where do I stand on certain demands that are being made of me in terms of behaviour, maybe in terms of um, what you say and how you act, as opposed to what the organisation's asking? Um, because I think if you don't, when you do at a very young age, you end up having a bit of a crisis later on because you will at some point begin to ask yourself those questions. And I think the sooner you do it, the, the better it is and the healthier it is to avoid having a, a bit of a potential crisis later on in your career. So start off with the intention of being whole. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I love that. I love that. Start off with the intention of being whole. And it's, it does take time. It does take quite deliberate effort. Um, and so it is a bit of an investment in your energy, in your time, maybe even financially. But it's most probably really worthwhile. Um, but there's, then again, I also think that coaching should become more accessible to junior levels of organisations. And again, the Air Force, I'm really pleased to say, are beginning to coach at very junior levels, um, not just at the very senior levels, which is what they've done historically, because I think they understand that demand for self-leadership from the very outset. Wow, how interesting. So anything else that you want to share from your learnings from this beautiful piece of reflection? I think the, the genuine reflection I've had of it is the absolute privilege and power of taking time to reflect. There are insights that I've gained about the Air, the Air Force and myself, which I would never have done if I had not managed to have a time to reflect. It's helped that I've also stepped out of it, so mm. I'm, I'm not sort of in the middle of it. Um, and, and for that, I suppose I would just say to anyone who is listening, whatever your reflection practice is, commit to it and invest in it, because I think you only really grow and recognise your genuine value and who you are as a human when you do take those times to reflect. Yeah, because that's prioritising you, isn't it, over prioritising yes. everything else? <laughs> And quite often, I do a lot of coaching with the military, as you, you know, I, I, that's where the vast majority of my clients come from. And when I say things like you've got to invest in yourself, there's almost a sense, oh, no, no, but I'm, I'm all about duty. I'm all about the service and trying to explain. But ultimately, to be able to do that, you need to be in your best possible position. So investing in yourself isn't selfish. Um, it is actually a real commitment to the organisation to be the best that you can be um, and so trying to change people's mindset on that's really important as well mm -hmm. it's the most beautiful thing Debs as we talk uh, to hear where you are now in your thinking because I can remember the very first time we met we were walking through the woods at the witch yes. cutting and you were telling me about it and and you you've developed so much of your thinking since then it's so it's so clear and it's such a beautiful offer yeah it's been i'm i think actually this this conversation we're having now and that conversation we had are sort of the bookends of two oh. years of my doctorate 
And I, and I can remember having that conversation and sort of the words coming out of my mouth and me thinking, oh, gosh, that all sounds a bit blurry. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded interesting, blurry. And, and and that is another thing I've had to really embrace through this doctorate is recognising that I have to experience things to learn from them. Yeah. And then to reflect on what I've experienced. And that's sort of what I've been able to do in my coaching now is I've had two years whilst I've reflected on my Air Force career of bumbling through what works for me in terms of coaching and having a bit of clarity now about what that golden thread is throughout my career Um, and although it's not always been consciously there that being human is what I'm absolutely about and and I I really want to let other people know just don't underestimate pitching up and being yourself it is the most powerful form of leadership that we can do and I love the sometimes the blurry takes two years to cook (laughs) I'm not a I woke, person. <laughs> I woke up in the night two days ago and had an insight and it's been cooking for months, months, yeah. months. And I suddenly woke up and I thought, I know, I know what that sound bite is. Yeah. That's going to help people become better coaches. So, um, and, and I don't think you can force it. And the other thing you can't do yeah. either. I mean, it's not that I've had two years of doing nothing other than reflecting. You know, I've had to be earning a living. I've had to be transitioning into my civilian life. It's, it's been busy. But amongst that, you find those moments to reflect. I, I think if I were just told to reflect for two years, I'd be like, oh. whoa. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> So, Debs, if people want to uh, find out more about your thinking or to to talk to you about it, how do they make contact with you? Best way is through LinkedIn. Um, I hate to be the um, same as everybody, but, uh, yeah, please do, do look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm there as Debs Wright. Um, I um, have not been posting recently because I've been submitting my doctorate, um, but I will be posting a lot. I generally post just stuff that really interests me and that I think will help other people. Um, And I would just love to hear from anybody who wants to have a conversation about how difficult the art of being human is, what challenges are in that, and why there are challenges. Because, um, yeah, it just absolutely fascinates me. And I, 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 I know I'm not alone. I worry sometimes that I am alone, but being human is hard work. It is a challenge, it is difficult. Um, but I, I think being human is the most wonderful thing you can be. And so um, I'm going to keep working on it. How fantastic. And if you want to meet Debs in the flesh, the Malvern Coaches Walks, plug again. Yes. We have yeah. a LinkedIn group called Coaches Walking. Or start one where you are. <laughs> Debs, thank you so much for coming to the Coaching In today. Claire, thanks for the invite. I've loved that conversation. Uh, and I better get reading Belonging Not Othering and <laughs> <laughs> before before the end of the winter so that you can come for breakfast and see because I'm not sure I really in the summer I'm not sure I want to have that conversation at four o'clock in the morning Let's thank you ev- thank you everyone for listening see you next time bye bye if you've enjoyed what you've heard today we'd love you to share the podcast with a friend or leave a comment on social media And if you'd like to become a regular at The Coaching Inn, you can subscribe on Podbean and all major podcast channels. We look forward to welcoming you next time. You've been listening to The Coaching Inn, 3D Coaching's virtual pub. For more information, check out 3dcoaching.com.